Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, this is Dan and Matt, as always, uh, here for Fireside Chat. And Matt, this is a a Heritage Classic that I don't think is going to be a classic in the Flames' minds. Um, Quite a a lousy effort tonight and a lousy effort all week. Yeah, it was a stoppable force against the movable object, and the Flames really didn't put anything in the way of any of the teams this week. Well, let's let's rewind to the beginning of the week. Last time we talked, the Flames were just finishing their road trip. Big w- loss to the Detroit Red Wings. They came home. We expected better. And uh, the New York I, the New York Rangers came to town on Tuesday the 24th in the Dome thinking, okay, maybe the Flames will do better. They got the first goal of the game and then ended up losing 3-1. And I don't think we need to get really far into this game. It was just a lousy effort by the Flames. Yeah, and any time a team comes up off a long road trip, usually they lose the first game back. Um, but there's losing and then appearing to have no pulse, which that's basically from the two-minute mark through the end, that was the case. Yeah, like this was not just a loss. They seemed like there was one team playing hockey in this game. Yeah. And, you know, credit to Jacob Markstrom. He was the only reason why the score wasn't like 7-1. Markstrom has been, I think, the shining star for the Flames this entire season so far. Yeah, him, A.J. Greer, and that's pretty much it, have been the standouts for this team. Thank goodness we claimed Greer off waivers. Who knew that we'd be getting our best player? That's right. And then Thursday night, the Calgary Flames took on the St. Louis Blues again here at the Dome. Couldn't score, got uh, Hofer, the Blues backup goaltender, his first shutout in the league. Like, when I see a team like the Blues, who I don't think anyone thinks is a top team, playing a, an unknown backup, you should be able to at least be competitive in that game. You shouldn't have a 3 nothing loss. Well, and frankly, like, this game wasn't just a 3 nothing loss. Like, the Flames had zero scoring chances the entire game. And realistically, any goalie who's played a competitive game of hockey at all would have stood a really good chance of getting a shutout in that game. That's how bad uh, the, this team was in that game. And, you know, in my mind, having to go back to the last time I saw anything even remotely close to this kind of performance, you have to go all the way back to the year that Dion Phaneuf was traded. Uh, the New Year's, uh, in between Christmas and New Year's, the Flames played a pair of games where they got shut out in both and played equally listless. Um, and got booed off the ice in both games. and I've tried to forget that one, Matt. Yeah, and that's the, like, the last time that like this team has just played that embarrassingly bad. And, yeah. You know, and I think you could see the frustration, too. Like, a lot of penalties in this one that didn't need to be taken. And I think you could just see that the guys were trying to get something, anything going. Yeah, and it just nothing at all happened. The one thing I do want to point out in this game, NHL debut for Calgary defenseman uh, Ilya Solovyev. We can never say his name properly. Um, Solovyev, uh, number 98 for the Flames, uh, playing in this game, making his debut. What do you think? I thought he was really solid, and I'm looking forward to him locking down a spot on this team over the next few years. Uh, He looks NHL ready, and, you know, it, his ceiling is what he makes of it, basically. I think uh, he'll yeah. be a four, five, six guy long term, but you know he has very good instincts and very composed. I would not have expected him to have played 16 minutes in that game, which he did. But you know, like you said, he looked good. He had two penalty minutes and one shot. Um, for the role that he was asked to play, I thought he did well. And we heard Daryl Sutter say all the time, you know, when you get the opportunity, take it. And I thought he did just that. Yeah. And in my mind, uh, of the three guys who've been rotating as the number six through the start of the year, uh, that Soloviev has been by far the best of the three. So that's Gilbert Osterley and Soloviev. Yeah. Well, Matt, that brings us to tonight, and we're recording this just after the Heritage Classic, a big 5-2 to two loss for the Flames against the Edmonton Oilers. Um, Connor McDavid miraculously ready to play again in the Heritage Classic. 
I would say here more of the same of what we've seen all week. Is that fair? Yeah. Um, like other than Mackenzie Weger driving the play a couple of times, resulting in Flames goals, uh, the Flames once again were completely listless and didn't really generate anything at all. Taking the one empty netter out, I think there's at least one of those, probably two. You can't blame on the goaltender either. No. Um, Frankly, Markstrom played well enough where if the Flames had been playing a reasonable game, they'd probably win that one. Uh, but when only one guy on your team really shows up, um, you know, it's hard to win games. No matter how good the goaltending performance is, you need people to actually generate offensive chances and... Like, we're just not, we frankly have seen maybe five scoring chances all week. You know, the, the, the Flames were getting beat, I'd say, by the Oilers in every respect here. Like, they couldn't get in front of the net. The Flames were keeping them out of their zone. The, Fl- the Oilers were able to keep the Flames hemmed in their own zone. Like, this just, the yes, Kadri got a goal, and that's great, and that's wonderful, and it's his first goal, and maybe he's getting going, but even after that, he disappeared again. Like, I'd say the story of the season so far is the same story as the Heritage Classic, which is the guys that needed to show up did not show up. No, and frankly, the the horses just aren't in the stable at all. Like, um, you need players who can actually shoot the puck at a first line, you know, like a 35-40 goal score level in order to have an offensive threat. And frankly... The three best shooters on our team, Matthew Coronado, Andrew Mangiapane, and Elias Lindholm, are all second-line level shooters who can benefit from an elite first-line guy like Lindholm did that one year. But, you know, like, they're not good enough with their shots in and of themselves to reliably be a, a dangerous scoring threat. So it's just difficult when you literally don't have anybody. So with that now, the Calgary Flames drop to second last in the league. They've played nine games. They have two wins, six losses, one overtime loss. That's called seven losses for five total points, tied with Edmonton. The only team worse than us, and I guess, you know, as bad as it is, you could say it's worse, the San Jose Sharks, who have nine losses, one overtime loss for one total point. I can't say I've ever seen that. Yeah, well, and you look at teams that generally make the playoffs, and by the end of the season, they generally will have around 30 regulation losses, maybe plus or minus one or two for the eighth seed. Um, you know, some years you can see a team having 32 or 33 losses, but generally, you know, 30 is roughly the right number. And, like, the Flames are already a fifth of the way there, and it's getting to the point where, like, they're going to need a seven-game winning streak just to erase... Their poor start. Not even to to get to like number one in the Pacific, just to get somewhere near a playoff spot. Yeah, just to resuscitate their season because it's already on life support. We talked last week about how you know we said preach. We were preaching patience. We told Flames fans, "Be patient." You know this team will come back. I'm not as convinced right now, Matt. Well, a baseball bat labeled reality kind of hit the Flames in the face, frankly. And after the. You know, there's only so much you can do. You know, you can have all the best intentions for your team to be successful, but if for whatever reason things just aren't working out, that's, you know, there's not really much you can do. No, that's very true. You can't. And, you know, I mean, it's not like nobody knows it's a problem, right? We've heard Zadorov apologize to the fans. He said they're playing terrible. We've heard fan players say that they would boo the team as well. Like, they got booed off the ice earlier. It frustrates me when you hear a whole team of guys, or even one or two guys, and we've heard this a lot in media scrums and scrums I've been in, scrums we've seen on TV, that sort of thing of, I need to do better. Well, go do it. Like in any other job, if I said to my boss, okay, boss, I need to be better, and I didn't get better, I'd get fired. Like, you know, it's frustrating when these guys say, we need to do better, I need to do better, I need to play better, and then they don't. And I guess, you know, last year it was, oh, it's Daryl Sutter, oh, it's whatever. Daryl's probably sitting at the farm right now, counting his cash, laughing at the team. Like, it's not obviously Daryl Sutter. I don't know at this point what the issue is. Well, to look back at Daryl when he was first hired, uh, 
what one of the things that I was preaching for to get him hired in the first place was that he would sort out the team. And because like there were sort of structural issues with the team where they kept falling apart in critical situations, aka the playoffs, and they needed to sort out what the issue was organizationally because there was a disconnect between talent and results. And, you know, I even said that, you know, like either the Flames will figure out their problems and ascend to that next level where they're an elite team and they actually vie for the Stanley Cup or it's going to blow the team up. And we're starting to see that those chickens have come home to roost and like the team's basically fallen apart. You know, and I mean, you and I have done this show for 11 full seasons. Now we're in our 12th season. Every year there's an excuse, whether from us, whether from the team, you know, we've talked about, okay, we need to change coaches. We've done that. Now we've changed GMs. We've changed the major personnel. Like at this point, I don't know what the problem is. And they just seem directionless. You have no idea what the Calgary Flames are. You go watch a Boston Bruins game, you know what the team is. You watch a Golden Knights game, you know what the team is. You watch a pick a team, almost, you know, I'd say 20 of the 32 teams, you know exactly what you're going to get. The Flames are just directionless, and it just feels like nobody has any idea what they're doing or why they're doing now. And I know you've mentioned this in the past, Matt. I'm starting to wonder... Is it time to just blow this thing up? Well, and you look at, like, the Flames over the last 20 years, like, you have to go all the way back to the 0304 Cup run when this team actually had an identity, where it was a bunch of guys that weren't overly talented, but they all skated hard and worked hard. And, you know, they put in the effort, and they were all pulling in the same direction. Then the Flames got away from that because they needed to get more talent on the team. And they sacrificed the direction for the talent and basically have not found their way ever since. And it's one of those where, you know, the Flames are in a good situation right now that because of the fact that there are no real lingering veteran guys that you don't have guys like with two, three, four years left on their deal that you can't shuffle out. Like, yes, you have Huberdo and Caudry, and they're going to be here for a long time. Well, let's come back to some of those individual names in a little bit but, here. But, you know, like everybody else, though, is on shorter term deals. And you have four guys that are free agents at the end of the year and a bunch of other guys that have like a year left after this one. So you can shuffle the deck chairs quite a bit without very much difficulty with this team. And it's and I think even outside of the team itself, we're staring down the barrel of a new building. I mean, they're saying 26 or 27. I'm more likely to think 2027 at this point, considering we don't even know what this thing's going to look like for them to start building it. Yeah. But, you know, if I was the owner here, I'd be taking a serious look at you know what? Yes, I want playoff hockey. Yes, I want playoff revenue. But the way it's going, I might not get that anyway. So why don't we start that process of rebuilding now so that when we are in that new building, we can go on a couple years of long, successful playoff runs? Yeah, and like if you look at the Flames when the last time they rebuilt, reality had to hit that team in the face with the same baseball bat we're getting hit with right now. And, you know, like it had been four years of missing the playoffs, just barely. And and when would you say that was? Like the term rebuild it means there was a build in the past. To me, this team's always just kind of changed out some deck chairs and kept going. I can't even remember the last time they sort of rebuilt fully. Oh, I don't think they've ever like truly rebuilt at any point. Even the Young Guns era, I don't think it was a rebuild. I think it was a it's all we can afford era. Yeah. And then, like, once they got a handful of pieces, they ran with it until... But, like, the last time that they kind of fell apart was in 2012-2013 when Aginla and Bomeister's contracts were up and same with Kipper. And it was one of those where reality, like, the team just wasn't good enough. Well, you have to move on. You know, like, it's four years missing the playoffs. Those guys aren't getting any younger you know, you have to do what you have to do because you 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 just suck at, at that point. And, like, the Flames ended up getting Sean Monaghan that year, 
which kick-started the handful of years of getting guys like Sam Bennett and Kachuk and Gaudreau in. And yeah, and I mean, when you're when you're trading Jerome for Kenny Agostino and Ben Hanowski, like I don't even know if we can call that a, a you know a rebuild. No, and then like the two draft picks that they got for those two guys ended up busting entirely Morgan Klimchuk and Emil Poirier. And that happens too, but you know, it, and that's part of the reason why, like you saw, like Kachuk's season and the Flames being bad enough still to get a guy like him, because like we just didn't have enough depth throughout the organization to carry on until we got him, and then started to backfill and more, uh, you know, as well. And the Flames basically. One thing I want to clarify yeah. here too: I've heard a lot of people talking about the building not being full, and. I think that's a little bit of a cop-out. We're going through an economic time here in Calgary right now, and I think across Canada, and we've heard Winnipeg, we've heard Calgary not full. I don't think it has, I think it has some to do with the team, but I just think right now, even if the team is going great, you're not going to get a full. No. People can't afford to go to a Calgary Flames game, pay for the tickets, buy the $10 Bud Light or whatever ridiculous price they're charging now, a $9 pocket dog. Like, yes, I think that some of it probably has to do with the fact that they're not playing well and there was disappointment last season, but I think a lot of this is just an, an economic reality of where we're at. Yeah, and... You know, that it just, everything doesn't help, but it makes sense that uh, economically the team's not, you know, in a good situation, and then the results on the ice make it even worse. Uh, basically, unless you're a fan of the other team playing, <laughs> you're not really going to be having a great time right now. <laughs> so, Matt, let's break this down. If we wanted, if you and I were the GMs of this team, or one of us, the GM, one's the whatever the assistant or president of hockey ops or whatever we want to yeah, say, we want we're to say both who's in who. charge. Yeah. There you go. Um, we want to look at a rebuild. Now let's not do the, you know, fictitious. Well, somebody could move if the deal's right. Of course that's true, but let's look realistically at this team, what's feasible and what's not. And we have to be careful here. You can't do this in one year. This isn't no. a garage sale. You don't sell everybody in one year and call it, you know, done. I think when I look at the forward group here, with a no movement clause for Jonathan Huberdeau and a no movement clause for Nazem Kadri, I think those two pieces that um, now Nazem's doesn't start till twenty six twenty seven, um, and the no movement clause for Huberdeau doesn't start till I guess twenty nine thirty. But even then, I don't think you're moving those pieces. No, like realistically, you, you would have to probably pay a, a king's ransom to move Huberdeau, and like to the point where like you're going to be the worst team in the league for 10 years to move that contract. Like it's it nonsensical. Um, and you know, I've heard people talk about buying out Kadri, but at the same time, if you're at the point of a buyout, you might as well just keep him on your lineup. Like, yeah. You know, when, when you're going into a, you're not going to buy him out if you're competitive, right? And if you're at the point you're rebuilding, you shouldn't need to, to be anywhere near the cap so just keep the bad contract on the books. Like I see no reason if this team decides to to go that way that you buy them out. And you still need veterans. Like you can't have, you know, 21 guys under legal drinking age run around on the ice. Like no. you still need some vets. And you look at the Dallas Stars as a perfect example of this. Like they signed Jamie Benn and Tyler Sagan to long-term contracts in much the same way that the Flames did with Kadri and Huberdeau. And they both proceeded to suck. And the team sucked, and they had to rebuild, and they were bad for four, five, six years. And while those contracts were still on the books, and those guys helped to shepherd in all the new guys, and now the Dallas Stars are once again one of the better teams in the league, and those guys are still key contributors on the, those teams, even though, you know, like it... it it's one of those where the Flames are just going to have to bite the bullet. Like, you do not need to have Huberdo. like, if you bought him out after this year, you don't need him being on the books for 14 years and Kadri for 10. Like, it's just... It's well, that's it. Like, just kind of, like you said, take your medicine, rebuild around them, and move on. And, and at that point, I mean, even if they're playing third, fourth line, that's okay. But, yeah. yeah, why do we need 14 years of misery from one of these guys? No, and it'll suck for five years if this is what it's going to take but 
then by the time the contract's over, if they're still NHL caliber at all, then you can move on from them at that point. But it it's one of those where you know, you're basically just stuck and how would you say they almost become irrelevant to the situation, even though because of the fact that there's not a damn thing you can do about them. You're rebuilding around them. Yeah, they're just there. And that's fine. And, you know, it, it is what it is. And you have to just figure out how to allocate the other $65 million that you have and go from there. And this. And I also want to say here in my mind, there's not one formula. It's not like when Conroy becomes GM, he's given a handbook, and Chapter 9 is how to rebuild. We've seen different teams do this differently. You mentioned Dallas in a similar spot to the Flames. I think the Flames could follow a model similar to what we've seen with Detroit. Like, I think there's things you can borrow, but it's not like there's one way to do this. Oh, no. Let's move down this list. Andrew Mangiapane, 27 years old, two years left. I think if you're going into a rebuild at $5.8 million, as soon as you get a good deal for him, you move on from him. Honestly, at this point, if he plays as poorly as he has for the last year and a half, that you know a buyout of his contract actually becomes... A fiz- feasibility because it will only. But even then, if you're go- if you're going into a rebuild, he again you can afford him for two more years, which is what you yeah. got. Yeah. Well, after this year, um, if you were to buy him out, it would only cost you uh, two million against the cap for two seasons. So you'd have four million dollars to spend elsewhere, and depending on you know to what extent, um how bad the you want this team like you're gonna need players that actually participate at the level of their contracts and you know the main problem is is that next season the flames owe montreal a draft pick and unless the flames are picking first overall they're getting our draft pick (laughs) but that's another reason why i think there's unlike the last two guys we talked about there's value in manjapani like i think you know even if not a first I think if you wait till next year at the deadline, you know, on his last year or even over the summer, I think you could recoup whether a draft pick or young players. I think there's some trade value there. I agree. It's just that one way or another, I think the Flames, like that would be a good contract to move on from. Mikel Backlund has uh, three years this year and two more. I don't see any way that if you go into a rebuild, you move that. I no. think you want... I mean, Mikel d- may decide he wants to move on at that point, and he has a modified no trade. Um, he has a 10-team trade list. But I, I think as long as he wants to be here, you keep him here. And if he doesn't, again, I think there's some asset value to be had there. Oh, yeah. And he would easily get a late first-round draft pick or a second plus. And... You know, th- that would be dependent entirely on what he wants and his family wants and circumstances, basically. And you know what? If he wanted out, if they go into rebuild, I wouldn't blame him at all. No. Sort of like Jerome. I w- he's a g- been a great flame. He's been a great soldier. He's done what he can here. And if he wants to chase a cup at 34, great, go do that. Yeah. Uh, again, one of those where he, he just has, he's in charge of his own boat. You know, and if he wants to go, that's fine. If he wants to stay, that's fine. Elias Lindholm, I think if you go into a rebuild, you have to move yes, before definitely. the before the deadline this year. You can't let him walk. There's value there. Oh, for sure. He'll, but he's he'll, also not worth he's not worth re signing at eight million or whatever ridiculous number he says he's gonna want based on how he's looking now. Oh no. And um like realistically you're looking at a first plus um more or less like what the Flames paid to get to Foley and then maybe a little bit more. Um, yeah, and a perfectly viable piece to move. And, you know, it would free up money in the off season to take a stab at somebody else. Igor Sharangovich, 25 years old, has two years. I think I'd keep him around. We still don't know what we have in this guy, and he's versatile enough. I think at 25, he can be part of that rebuild, and you can play him anywhere in the lineup. I agree. You need veterans. He's qualifies, so... Yeah. Dylan Dubé is 2.3 this year in RFA at the end of the year. I think I'd qualify him, because as much as we've talked about maybe they're playing him too high, I think... 
he could still be a good soldier there. Yeah. Well, and how do you Corn say up. you need organizational pieces? And, like, if Manjapane was getting, like, $3 million a year, then, you know, like, there'd be no... You'd keep him entirely just to be the serviceable mm -hmm. middle six guy. But the it's the $6 million for him. Dubé at 2.3, perfectly fine. Yeah, I think even if... I mean, by the time you qualify him, you generally got to offer him a bit more. So let's say 2.7. You know, I wouldn't do a long-term deal, but I think, you know, 2.7 if he wants to stick around at two or three years... Sure, I think he's a serviceable piece. He's 25 to put with some younger guys. Why not? Yeah, and it's one of those where if the contract's a little too rich for what they think he brings, that's also a player that if you had to walk away from, that's also not the end of the world. Uh, yeah, and if you walk away and get nothing for him, I'd be okay with that too. Yeah, it's one of those where... Uh, you know, like we've seen other teams where, like they've let, get, like the Oilers, where they let Anathasiu and um, Yamamoto go, even though they're viable NHL players, but the, like they just weren't worth their contracts that they were going to get. And you know, uh, and he's also a guy that I think if anybody calls on him, you take it. Yeah, you know, whatever the whatever the nice man on the other side of the phone's offering for Dylan Dubé this year, if he, they call, you take it. Yeah, if they offer a third or a fourth, fine, bye. Yep. Um, I think we can all we can both agree that uh, Matthew Coronado, Walker Dewar, Dryden Hunt, AJ Greer all stay. Yeah. Either you um, wouldn't Greer's, get much of anything for him, like Greer, um, no. or Dewar, or you know Hunt. Yeah, but you're gonna just keep them because you need serviceable yep. young players. Adam Rajichka, you keep. Yeah. Looking on the back end, so we've really moved out one forward by the deadline. We've moved out Elias Lindholm, which feels about right to me. You maybe bring Connor Zari up in that spot. Um, maybe they're able to move a guy like a Dylan Dubé or somebody like that. But I think for the end of this year, moving out that one forward spot, I think feels about right for year one. Yeah, because there's not really um, much you can do. Like you know like you have guys like blake coleman and michael backland who are very good third line players but oh yeah it's a guy we didn't talk but, about is coleman. um you know like you're not gonna trade them because they're also very good third line players unless they specifically want to go well and, the, and even coleman has a no trade clause um as of 24 25 so starting next year so if he wanted out i think there'd be value for him but again you know if you're if you're getting rid of some of your money now the flames are always going to be hindered by let's call it 17 million on the books for huberto and Kadri during this rebuild i think you can still afford though especially with the cap going up next year 4.9 on the books like you know i would keep coleman until either again a suitor calls or he decides he's out yeah and both um, Backlund and, and Coleman are veteran guides. And that like they deserve and the respect. And Backlund and Coleman make whoever they play with look better. And yeah. that's what you need when you're rebuilding. Yeah. And, you know, they deserve the respect of being able to navigate their own destiny. On the on the back end, um, again, Mackenzie Wieger signed to a long-term deal at 29. I think you keep him yep, here. Definitely. Uh, Noah Hannafin is 26 on his last year. I think that's like Lindholm, and we've all talked about this all year, a guy you need to find value for and might even be your best trade chip. Yeah, and I look at like what uh, Boston gave up uh, for Hampus Lindholm. That's basically what you're going to get for Hannafin, which was a first and a couple of good prospects. Rasmus Anderson, I think you he's 27, he's got three years left. I think you keep him here, you keep him as your number one D man and figure out where we are in, you know, 2026, 2027 when it's time for renewal. Yep. Um Chris Tanev, I think you'll let walk at the end of the year. If there's value at the deadline, take it and move him. Yeah. But I think um I don't think you bring back a 34 year old Tanev at this point. No, if you get a second or a third, great. At that point, like because teams will always want a guy like Chris Tanev because of his warrior nature. It's just, you know, not going to be necessary if the Flames are in tank mode. Well, and okay, let's talk about that. I hate this term tanking. I don't think I ever want to see my team tank for a number one pick. Oh, no. But, you know, it's one of those where you're going to try to maximize your assets and, like, you're not going to need... Uh, Tanev to play out the rest of the season 
you know, so no, but you're good. But I, I ne- you know, and we've heard, you know, bad for Bedard and all these different rhymes. I never want to see the Calgary Flames tanking, yeah. you know? I think even if you're bad, you should be in a lottery position, a top 10 position either way. And if you can't make something out of a top 10 pick, you got some serious development issues. Yeah, pretty much. Right? I mean, yes, it's cool to have the top guy and all that, but all remind fans, there's a lot of times, just because you draft first overall, it doesn't work out. First guy that pops in my head, Alex Dagg, Patrick Stefan. Like, you know, just because we're getting that top guy doesn't mean our franchise is saved. Oh, I know. And like Slavkovsky for Montreal, it doesn't look very good. And Lafreniere is only just starting to look like a top prospect now in his like third or fourth season. And, you know, and it's hard uh, when you're not getting a guy like Bedard. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's one of those where if the Flames are in a position, frankly, if they're picking first or fifth, like, they'll get somebody decent. They just have to figure out how to translate that guy into a star player. Yeah, and you have time to develop them, right? And so many teams, I mean, it's been a long time since outside of Edmonton, we've seen a Canadian team draft first overall. Like, you know, most Canadian teams can already sell hockey. A lot of these teams like Chicago, like Tampa Bay, like, you know, the Penguins, they needed a number one guy to put a name on the marquee. I don't think the Flames need that. And so, you know, even if you're drafting lower and you're taking time to develop that guy... I still think that you're going to be able to sell hockey in this market. You don't need to do what so many teams do. Look, we've got this guy. Come see him. It's like a circus attraction. Yeah. You know, and as much as I would find it a a nice thing if the Flames were able to get Jerome McGinley's kid in the draft this year, you know, like it would also be a little bit of an eye roll. In a lot of ways, I think it'd be better for T. McGinley not to play here because you're never going to get out of dad's shadow. No. Right. I mean, yes, it'd be cool, but I think in the long term, you're never going to be, um, you know, you're never going to be able to be your own player. You're always going to be compared to to Jerome. Yeah. Which, you know, mind you, in the highlights, he looks exactly like his old man other than he shoots left. For sure. But I mean, <laughs> let's say he takes a couple of years to develop or whatever. It's going to be always, you know, slowed or, you know, whatever the media likes to say about that. Like, I think it's cool. But it, when I think about it long term, I'm not sure it's best. Maybe if you want to bring him in, bring him in once he develops somewhere else. Yeah. Um, Nikita Zadorov also up this year. I think it's hard to find another defenseman with his skill set at 3.75. I would even be okay to give him a raise till he's 30 or 31 up to about 442 just to keep a veteran guy on the blue line. Yeah, I could even see going upwards of 5 just because of his unique skill set. But it's one of those where it also depends on what's available at the trade deadline. Like if you're getting and, like a low first the, for Zadorov because, like, mm-hmm. we've seen other teams pay stupid money for uh, the high-quality depth-defending defensemen, you know, uh, from other teams. And, you know, teams giving up a late first for, you know, guy just because, oh, he's big and he's tough. You know, if you get that, fine. You know, as, as much as, like... Yeah, if I you, lo- like, like I said about Dubé, if you can move him, move him. Yeah, and, like, as much as, uh, you know, Zadorov, frankly, has been... M- my favorite Flames player probably since again left. You know, it's one of those where I would love him to stay, but if the return's right in this particular case, yeah, you have to put the team first. For sure. And even if he walks as a UFA, like, you know, we don't have enough defensemen on the Wranglers to fill roles if Tanev, Zadorov, um, you know, Hannafin all leave this year. Like, I don't think they have three NHL caliber defensemen. So even if he stays, they think there's son of the deadline. There isn't any leaves a free agent. I'm okay with that too. Yeah. It's not ideal, but I could, I could be okay with that. Yeah. And you have to figure that like Poirier should be back by then, but yeah, it, it, it's tough. Like, they'll... right. But who do you bring up? Like, you know, Poirier and well, Solovia I... and Osterley and, uh, Gilbert would be, your bottom four, I guess. And yeah, and either, what, Pullman or Simone? Like, yeah, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it, it, at that point, you're basically just running out the string. And, you know. Yeah, that's true. It's kind of a who cares about the end results. You're trying to get guys ice time to audition for next year. 
And just because they don't have a lot of depth, I'd be okay if they want to bring Osterley back again, just to sort of fill a D role for next year. Yeah. So Loviev stays. I think Gilbert stays. Yeah. On the on the goalie side, I mean, Markstrom, as much as you've talked about moving him, he has a no movement clause, um, and it's fully in effect now. I think, honestly, you're going to have to, just like the two forwards, you're going to have to kind of run out that deal as a flame. Yeah, unless he specifically wants to go to a contender. And mind you, there are a bunch of teams that could use this type of Mar- Jacob Markstrom and would for be sure. willing to pay for it. And if that happens, great. Yeah. But if not... I mean, that's not, you know, if he's got no move, he's got no move, right? Yeah. And, realist- and if he's got to stay here, that's okay, too. Yeah, and realistically, I'm sure that Marks from himself would probably prefer to move on if the Flames are rebuilding. I agree. Because, um, you know, he's getting up there in age, and I think he would want to try to win a Stanley Cup, too, much like Backlund and, you know, all the other veteran guys, so... You know, it makes some sense where he would want to move, and the Flames kind of would per- probably prefer to move him and have Ladar and Wolf be the tandem just to let the two young guys vie for the spot over the next year or two. So that was going to be my, I guess, scenario here. Is if Markstrom moves, I think then you have to keep Ladar and you run Ladar Wolf and let one of them win the starter job. Yeah. If you can't move Markstrom, I think the natural thing to do is find a, a buyer for Vladar, and I think there's some out there right now, especially, and look at bringing Dustin Wolf in. And even then, I think, you know, we've talked about how would Wolf get enough starts and stuff. I think you force that matter at that point. Like, yeah. I think you don't need to have, if you are in a rebuild, I don't think you need to have, you know, any certain number of games for Markstrom. If you want to play 30 games, that's okay. Like I think if you if you go with a Markstrom Wolf combo in a rebuild, and I like the idea of that because then you've got the season backup if Wolf can't do it or if Wolf runs into trouble, but you you're not looking to okay, we gotta play him in fifty, or we gotta play him until he wins. Yeah, and you're basically would be looking at how uh Nashville handled UC Soros at that point. And that's a good uh, good and, comparison. You yeah. know, they had Pekka Rene there and he played more than half the games, but you know, it was more of an even split. It was like 50 to 45, you know, basically in in terms of the percentages. And, you know, it ended up that it slowly transitioned to Soros as the seasons went on. And, you know, as Soros got better and more accustomed to the NHL, and now they have a top-tier goaltender and successfully transitioned from the old guard to the new. And I think that if the Flames aren't able to move Marks from, you'll see that same kind of trajectory with Wolf. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, again, this isn't going to be a one-year thing. It's not like we're going to sell everybody. It's, you know, not Huberto, Kadri, or um, Markstrom in one year and, and replace these guys. And even looking at the Wranglers, I mean, they don't have the the talent to replace those guys with, you know? I mean, sure, maybe Hanzig, Zari, um, you know, depending on who you ask, Swint might be in there, um, Pospisil could, but, you know, this is going to be multiple years. And I think even then, especially on the defensive side, the cupboards are not as deep where you're going to see them either trading for young players, either AHL guys or younger NHL guys, or even signing 22, 23, 24-year-olds for the first couple of years just to essentially ice a team. Yeah, and realistically, you know, like I'm sure that like if the Flames say trade Marks from trade Lindholm, trade Hannafin, like you're going to be getting decent quality prospects back. And, you know, you're going to target like a guy who's like, say like a 22-year-old defenseman that's ready for the NHL that they just don't have room for. Or, yeah. you know, the young forward who has some pop who could be a second line forward for that team or a prospect that's kind of run out, you know, sort of like how New Jersey traded Pavel Zaka to Boston where, you know, it just wasn't working out for them. And yeah, I, I guess we're both probably trying to say the same thing is you're not, you can't just go out there and get a handful of draft picks. Oh. The flames are going to need to get some picks for sure. And also some, you know, young NHL ready or, you know, NHL auditionable players. Yeah, and like a lot of people criticize the Toffoli trade, but realistically that was 
pretty much the archetype of a perfect trade for this situation. The Flames needed a, a quality roster player who can play third, second line minutes, and they got a high quality draft pick out of it and used that pick very smartly and got a prospect who looks like he might be something special out of it. And that's great, you know, because like, uh, Zanayev's so looking really good in the NCAA thus far to start the year. Perfect. And, you know, the Flames will need to get guys that can play at the NHL level while the younger guys develop and then turn it over once the young guys are ready and push the veteran guys out. Yeah, and I think it's going to be a little bit of a different rebuild than we've seen in some recent markets. It's not like you're going to say, okay, you know, Coronado, Zari, Pelt, or... Uh, yeah, Peltier, you're the first line. I think you're going to see, you know, some of these young guys brought in as third, second line guys. I think you'll see guys like Dubé moved up to the first line because they're the veteran. And I think over those five years, you're going to see the older guys phased out when the time is right. Yeah. And like we saw uh, thus far this season that Coronado, even though he looked really good in the preseason, his overall game has been lacking at the NHL level. And, you know, the Flames don't really have anybody else right at the moment that could replace him. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those where they're taking him along slowly. They're putting him down in the lineup and utilizing him on the power play so that way he can learn the offensive side while refining his overall game. And, like, this team's going to take a while to, you know, foster those guys into the lineup, into the spots they need to be. And it's not an immediate process. Like, you know, you, you, as good as Coronado is, like, you can't just plug and play him on the first line. Like, he's not a fully developed guy yet. Yeah, and, you know, this might sound weird. I mean, I think this team, whether they tell us or not, are going to know what they want to do by, let's say, American Thanksgiving, the end of the calendar year at the latest. Yeah. You know, you can only make trades when trades come up, but I think you're going to know by then what you are and start making those calls or fielding those calls or that sort of thing. But I might even say if the Flames think that they're not going to make it this year and make a run for it, I'd send Coronado to the AHL. I would not be surprised if at some point he is sent to the A. And that, you know, and I could see that even over the next couple of weeks, frankly, like it, it as like we get towards the end of November, like give him. The I still think that if Peltier was here, he'd be in the American League right now. Yeah, I agree. Uh, he probably would have got a little bit at the start, like five or six games, and then as he's shown that he's not quite ready, put down. At this point, it's not really hurting him being on the fourth line because he is getting the high quality power play. But I just wonder if it's hurting him being in this room and being around some of these players and what I imagine is negativity. Like, the Wranglers doing good. The Wranglers, I think, are more positive. It might be good to just put him down there, A, to polish his game, and B, to get him away from some of that negativity. Yeah, and frankly, I think the Flames could use an energy player, like whether you recall Klapka or, you know, Pospisil or something, and throw him on the fourth line and throw Coronado on the first line down there. That would also make a lot of sense. It's one of those where just have to wait and see. Uh, but it, it's just tough right at this point. On this same idea of a rebuild, and this is the thing that, you know, pundits have said in Calgary for years, the fan base won't accept it. The fan base, you know, will not show up. The fan base will not show up to the games. Now, I think if you go on a rebuild, you in some ways cannibalize your market for the Wranglers because there's not going to be many players you want to see down there but i mean that's got to happen at some point i can't remember the last time we saw a canadian team rebuild that had their ahl team in the same city so there's no real you know metric for that well realistically but, like if you look at the flames like if they go into a rebuild yeah their attendance numbers are going to struggle like you look at all of the canadian markets like vancouver was down around nine ten thousand when they were bad um, Toronto didn't sell out every game when they were terrible. Um, Montreal, same thing. Ottawa became a, you know, a ghost town for a while while they were terrible. It's natural. And, you know, you're only going to get 12, 13, 14,000 when, you know, like your team's looking like its head's going to get caved in night in, night out. And 
how would you say the fan base is more than happy to accept a rebuild if it the team is actually showing a direction and that's basically been the problem over the last decade plus is that where are they going <laughs> you know like yeah. if you commit to a rebuild yeah it sucks it's boring it's lousy to see your team getting kicked around by everybody but at least you can realize that hey at the end of the day this team will get better as we get players through the draft develop guys sign free agents and slowly turn the team around because we've got an actual direction and an identity that we're trying to put in place and fans are smart enough where they can see like if you're drafting guys that look legit you know they're gonna get excited and it, it was like when the flames had monahan bennett kachuk Gaudreau. you know it looked like hey great you have a bunch of really good young guys and they look like they're going in a positive direction you know and the the team fans will buy into that but you know like right you now you can sell success and you can sell hope and right now the flames have neither they don't have success and there's really no hope of success with you know what we've seen over the last couple of years i mean sure a playoff round or two but i think we can all say in our hearts you know based on what we saw last year and what we're seeing so far even if the flames shape up at this point I don't think that they're, you know, going to completely turn this around and make it to the Western Conference Finals. So I think in some ways you've just got to do it, sell the hope, take the hit on the ticket sales, like you said. But if I was the owner, I'd rather take the hit now than when I'm trying to pay for a new building. Exactly. And that's the key right now. Like, say like my tickets, right, um, that I have, like they're about $55, $60 a ticket per game. You know, and like it comparable to the Oilers, like that ticket's probably two hundred dollars now for the Oilers new building. It would make a lot more sense to eat a you know fifty dollar loss now than a two hundred dollar loss then. And mm -hmm. you know, and if the team's looking like they actually have their stuff together in a couple of years, then you know everybody's going to be extremely happy to dish out the 200 250 300 dollars a ticket because hey there's something to actually watch and this is the hockey market i mean we saw with edmonton too when they went through their rebuild people will come yeah right i mean people want to see hockey and again they'll want to see the hope i mean you know this is a a market that for years wanted to just bring up the young player bring up the young player let's take a look at them like i think this is a market that you might not sell 20,000 seats. You might not sell 17,000 seats, but you're not going to get down to 5,000 or 10,000. Like, no. you know, even if you're selling to seats, to see the other guys, you know, if you're selling seats, to see Bedard or whoever, you know, the next generation is, this is a, a team that, yeah, sure. You'll lose a couple thousand, but to me, it's short-term pain for long-term gain. Yeah. And realistically, you know, a reasonable rebuild is going to take you three to four seasons. Which, if you project that out, well, that's the opening of the new building. So, you know, like, and realistic. I look at this for the Flames being at least five years. I think in yeah. three years you start to come out of it, but I don't think yeah. that they'll probably really be legitimate Western Conference contenders for at least five. Oh, I agree. And that's where, you know, like the Flames basically need to... Uh, be shrewd asset managers as well and like especially like if they say they do trade off all the guys that we mentioned at the trade deadline and don't re-sign them then you know like the flames are going to basically be a player on july 1st because we'll basically be one of the few teams that actually has dollars to spend uh because the cap while it's going up is not going up by a ton and most of the rest of the league is basically hamstrung without the ability to pay anybody. And I wouldn't be surprised if even if they're going into a rebuild, retool, restructure, whatever you want to call it, reduce, reuse, recycle, if the Flames were to use that cap money, because they're not going to spend to the cap, I mean, nobody does, even if they bring in some bad contracts from other teams and get paid to do that, yeah, exactly. I think there's still going to be veterans, especially on the blue line. I mean, they're going to need blue liners, especially, I think, but I wouldn't be surprised if you see them start to bring in some of those bad deals. Not guys that can't play like Arizona, but well, bad sort contracts of, like of the guys Monahan that are useful. Contract 
for example, yeah. where the guy's still a decent player when he's healthy. But we paid a million dollars, or a, sorry, a first round pick to get rid of him. Oh, I know. And like, there will be teams that are in a cap crunch like Toronto was, where, you know, it's like, we need you just to take the guy off our con, you know, contract list, even if you just put him on IR because mm -hmm. we can't afford to do it. And, you know, it, it might be a situation like that. Like, I was reading a graphic the other day that said that I think it was 14 teams are, like, using the LTIR right now just to be cap compliant. And, you know, like, those teams, like, even if they have the money at the end of the season to, with the new uh, bump up in the, the salary cap, like, that's just going to be going to keep their own guys. Like, it's not like they're going to be able to go and spend on the free agent market so yeah and even if the flames said they want to do this they are not going to be able to do a lot this season no like you can't just start trading guys mid-season i think a lot of these trades will happen at the deadline you know the lindholm maybe hannafin that yeah. sort of thing like you, it, january I, february is likely where you'd start to see the, some of those things happen i think this year the flames have to chart their course is their course to contention or is their course towards rebuild even if not a lot happens until the off season I think they need to know which way they're moving. Yeah. How would you say? You don't need to necessarily also commit fully to a, like, complete teardown rebuild either. But, you know, like, this team does need a big restructuring. And, you know, the only way to do that is to make a whole bunch of trades. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I think at this point, I mean, again, we've tried different coaches. We've tried different top players. We've tried different GMs. I don't know what the problem is, but I think the problem at this point is just bringing in a bunch of veteran pieces and hope they gel. And I think we need to, you still need some vets on the team, but I think we need to really relook at this and say, you know what, we're willing to build the team before we try and win. Yeah. Maybe that's the best way to say it. Yeah. And, you know, taking a stark, realistic look at this team, like there is not enough there to make the playoffs. You know, as nope. it sits right now. We both now. hoped there would be. Yeah. But I think last year showed us something as well. And the other nice thing about, I think, now is a rebuild time. I think that the fan base here would accept it now. I don't know they would have a few years ago. You've got a young coach. You've got a young GM. I think this is now Conroy's chance to put his stamp on this team. And I think this is now a team that can grow with Ryan Huska as well. Yeah. Like, I think if you're willing to commit to those guys long term, they can be the guys to see you through this. Yeah. And like, if you look at, like the flames changed their uh, draft persona a bit this past draft where they were taking guys that were both skilled, but also big. And I think that like, it, you know, shying away from guys in the Munjapane Dubé, uh, Coronado build frame. And I think that, you know, like that's also a step in the right direction because you can have one of those guys. That's that kind of guy, but you can't have, like half your team being undersized because then they just get pushed around. You know, like uh, this team needs to be bigger, stronger, faster. And, you know, the only way to do that realistically is through the draft and, you know, just keep hammering at those picks. Pick yeah, I think they're going to have to look at getting some higher end defensemen through the draft as well. Yeah, and to their credit, both Poirier and Emile Moran both look exceptional and look like future top four defensemen in the NHL. So if they can, those two guys actually stick the landing on that and actually become that, then, you know, that will ease a huge amount of the problem for this team and have, and maybe that's, you know, talking about more and maybe that's an interesting place to go with this as well. I think that too often when you see teams rebuild, it's bring up anybody who's of age to the NHL. And I think the Flames have to be willing to develop players in the AHL still. Like, I don't want them to say, okay, we need a defenseman more and you're up because you're the next, you know, best guy on the depth chart. I think you need to still be able to say, hey, let's season him in the NHL. Let's bring him up when he's ready. Even if that's yeah. two, three years well, into the rebuild, you can't just pull up all the guys as soon as they're 18 and say, all right, you're in the NHL. Yeah, well, and we saw that with uh, Anderson and uh, Shillington where – like they were exceptionally good uh, right out the gate when we drafted them and were very good prospects and they got 
you know, a few years in the AHL before. But the team was at a different place then. They could maybe more afford to do Oh, that. I know. And that's where, like, getting guys through trades and or free agency as reasonable stop gaps is also going to be key for this team. Yeah, and, you know, I wouldn't be surprised just because of the lack of, I think, blue line depth in the AHL right now. I wouldn't be surprised, especially on the blue line, if you see them bring in 25 to even a 33-year-old guy for a year or two and just kind of, you know, work through that system, making sure guys like Poirier, who deserve a spot, get one and then fill it with Osterley-type players. Yeah, or even, like, going out and getting another Chris Tanev-type who's, like, 28, 29, you know, just viable you know sort of yeah, like i don't a, know if i'm a chris tanev type is 28 i would sign here well you look at like uh matt dumba for example signing with arizona and that was mainly because arizona was the only team who had money to be able to afford what he was looking for and you know if the flames are in that situation in the off season you know there are only so many places that have money so the flames still even though like with all the problems in the organization are a legit viable destination because at the end of the day, the checkbook matters as well. Yeah, for sure. And, and again, you'll look at whatever that is. I mean, even with a Dumba, you know, it's possible. I don't know how much is going to happen next year with the cap going a little bit more, but definitely whether it's through injuries, like you talked about through LTIR through free agency, there's going to need some viable bodies that aren't necessarily in the organization now for a couple of years, I think, until they can rotate everybody in and out. Like, I don't want them to rush this. I don't want this to be like the Oilers where they're perpetually rebuilding for eight years. If we're going to do this, let's do it right. Let's have the patience and then let's come out the other side. Yeah, and like, that's why uh, to bring it back to earlier this week's games, you know, uh, having Ilya Soloviev making his NHL debut and him looking solid this is a perfect opportunity to keep him in the lineup for the rest of the season. Yep. Because if he can learn how to be in the NHL and a quality NHL player, one of your problems solved right there. And, yep. you know, then you don't need, because he's an older player that we drafted. He was 20 when we drafted him. And, you know, yeah, he's young for professional experience, but, you know, he looks NHL ready, so let her rip. And I think more so in a rebuild like we're talking about um, than, say, you know, where the Flames are at, you have to bring these guys in with no expectation. You're not going to come in and say, we expect them to be a top four. We expect them to be a top eight, you know, yeah. or, you know, forward or whatever. I think at that point, you've just got to say, we'll give you a roster spot. You show us what you are. Yeah, and uh, that's why, like, I could see, like, a guy like Connor Zari uh, playing in the NHL later this year, uh, more like after the trade deadline kind of thing. Uh, for down sure. the stretch and you know a few other guys like uh Pedersen and um Pospisil and Klapka like those guys like especially if the Flames do ship off a bunch of players that you yeah even if they ship off one or two I think you'll see you know at least one or two of those guys brought in yeah just to play out the stretch to, so that way they can see what they have in them for next year as well and you mentioned um, Poirier earlier, just before we get to our predictions, just so fans know, Poirier got injured on October 21st. He suffered a skate laceration of the arm. He needed surgery to pair it, and he will be out indefinitely. So uh, with him out, with Solovia out, again, the blue line's looking a little bit weak on uh, on the Wranglers. Yeah, and realistically, uh, with other players that have suffered that kind of injury, uh, whether it was a Vander Kane or others, uh, generally it's about four to six months. So around the new year february around the trade deadline will be when he'll be returning to the lineup uh and even then i don't think you even if you got a spot i think you send him to the hl oh you yeah for sure start him right in the nhl yeah i could see him playing like the last two or three games of the year type of thing but the, like that would be it like it, it. And anytime you have a guy like that, except in very extreme cases, I think anytime you have a guy like that who's going to lose, let's call it for all intents and purposes, the majority of the season, almost all of it, I think you want them. And we saw this with Zari. You want them in the AHL the next year. You want to give them back that dev year. Yeah, I agree. And I'm expecting that Poirier likely would start the next year next year, unless he has a training camp where like Coronado did. Uh, where like he's just tearing the cover off of it 
that uh, you just let him stay in the A for the f a good portion of the year, maybe getting called up halfway through, for or sure. being the injury call up guy. Well, we'd love to hear all our fans' thoughts. Do you think that there's still hope? Do you think it's time to look for a rebuild? Do you have some other idea? Is there another way you think this should go? Or what would you do if you were Craig Conroy right now? Are you giving up on this season? And you can get a hold of us through any of our social media. You can find them all at our website, firesidechat.ca, right at the top. Send us a message through the website. Leave a comment on the show. We'd love to hear what you're thinking. Uh, Matt, should we get to our predictions for the coming yeah. week? And I know like this episode has been a little bit overly negative. And, like, yeah, the record's two and seven, and it does seem like we're panicking a little bit, but it's more not the fact that they've lost those games, but, like, how they're looking while losing all those games. I think we're being realists for where they are, and there's an old saying that from every new beginning comes some other beginning's end. I think we might need to look at this as, you know what, this era of the Flames is coming to an end. And that's okay, yeah. but we need to have a plan for it. Exactly. Every team rebuilds at some point. Yep, no Matt. No team has been competitive forever and always. Yeah, like how long was Detroit terrible after being amazing for a long time? Mm -hmm. Or uh, Pittsburgh, like they're currently the worst team in their division. Chicago's the worst team in their division. Like, yeah, you know, it's natural. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think the Flames have been artificially keeping themselves from doing so, and I think maybe it's time to just admit that, you know what, this is... This is the cycle of a of an NHL team. Yep, and it sucks, but it is what it is. So last year, last week, you and I were uh, on different places with our predictions. I thought we'd win against Edmonton. We'd lose to New York and St. Louis. I was close. Um, I was a little optimistic on the classic game. You thought we'd win New York and St. Louis, lose to Edmonton. The Flames this week have two games in the docket. They have a couple days off. They'll play next Wednesday. Um, 6.30 p.m. start time in the Saddle Dome against the Dallas Stars, and then they have two more days off, and they'll play Saturday at 8 p.m. start time against the Seattle Kraken. Matt, I'll give you my thoughts here. I'm going to go with the um, the current streak, unfortunately, and I think they're going to lose both these. Um, well, you took my prediction right out of my mouth, so... Should we go with the same one for the week? Yeah. Uh, I have zero faith in this team at this point. Dallas is a good team. Dallas is a team that's always given the Flames uh, an issue. And I think that they're going to, especially with the Flames playing the way they are, I think they're going to continue to give the Flames an issue. Yeah. Seattle I, also is struggling much like the Flames. And like if we're going to win one, it'll probably be that one. But yeah, uh, the effort level that Seattle gives in each game and the effort level the Flames do, I don't see that. Yeah, and, and I just, I don't know. I think being on the road, if it was here, it might be different, but being on the road, I think, yeah, I, I think that might be the, I think they'll, they're they going to drop that one. It might be close, but I think they're going to drop that one. Do you put Markstrom in for both games? Yeah, might as well, because uh, there's just so much time in between games, and he's been good, so just let him stay on the roll that he is, because the last thing that you need it. is, frankly, for him to get off the tangent a bit and then like immediately next week like they're on the 10th and the 11th they're playing a back-to-back -back, and then they're playing a couple days later on the 14th so i'm assuming that uh vladar would get in at least one or two of those games toronto or ottawa yeah we did see though the markstrom sat a bit last week and still looked good and i think if they want to see him i would put him in this week in seattle over dallas yeah i agree you know, and if they're trying to get him going, that's the one to do. But yeah, I agree with you. I think right now you let Marks from keep going. Yep. Well, Matt, let's hope we're wrong, and uh, I'll talk to you next week when we'll find out. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.